Good afternoon. Uh, they apologize for giving me two microphones. I said it's perfect for a split personality. <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying in uh, scripture that you shouldn't say everything good about a person while you're in their company. So as flattered as I am by the introduction today, I can't help but think how much more might have been said about me if I had the wisdom not to be here today. <laughs> when my daughter was young and I started to ask her a question, she would point to her wrist and the small watch sitting there and ask me if this was going to be one of the long ones or the short ones, Dad. <laughs> and uh, Mark Twain said the great thing about kids is they tell you what they know and then they stop. And Thomas Dewey, the educator, liked to say there's a world of difference between having to say something and having something to say. Hopefully somewhere in that mix I have learned something and you will not suffer for it. And you will not be pointing and saying, is this going to be one of the longer ones or one of the shorter ones today? Adelaide Stevenson, the late candidate, uh, governor from Illinois and senator and uh, candidate for president, liked to begin his talks by reminding the audience that my job here today is to speak, and your job here today is to listen. Experience has taught me that you will finish your job before I finish mine. <laughs> there was a man who uh, was going to see his doctor for his annual physical, but was concerned about his wife's hearing. So when he visited the physician, he said, I'm concerned my wife is losing her hearing. And the doctor said, I'll have her in for a test, but why don't you do this when you go home tonight? Why don't you stand at some distance and say something to her and see if she hears and then stand a little bit closer and then a little bit closer. And he said, I will, I will. He goes home that evening and he stands across the house and he says, hey, dear, what are we having for dinner? No answer. He moves a little closer. Hey, honey, what are we having for dinner? Still. Here's nothing. Moves closer yet. Hey, honey, what are we having for dinner? Nothing. Moves closer yet. Hey, honey, what are we having for dinner? Finally, he's standing right next to her and he says, Hey, honey, what are we having for dinner? She says, Damn it, Phil, for the fifth time, we're having chicken. <laughs> what we hear in life is often premised by our capacity to listen, and what will we hear? Years ago when I was in New York, a woman said she wanted to meet me, uh, and uh, her husband had been a big supporter of the Lincoln uh, uh, Opera House in New York. And uh, she said that he was very good friends with the composer Toscanini. And the reason she wanted to talk to me is because at the end of each of the performances, Toscanini would say to her husband, how did you like the concert? How did you like the concert? He said, the music was great, the music was great. And, she, and he said, no, how were my silences? How were my silences? And Jacob, in my book, Jacob the Baker, says, it is the silence between the notes. So it is my hope today that if you will hear the music in what I have to say today, you will listen to the silence between the notes. And you will listen to yourself. And perhaps you will listen in a way that you had not heard before. Uh, you heard in the introduction that I like going to Italy. On one of the visits there, I was in the small town of Amalfi on the, cryptically enough, Amalfi Coast. And uh, they have a statue there to uh, Flavio Goya, who uh, 500 years ago, uh, uh, you know, the uh, apocryphal story is that he discovered the compass. So I wanted to know a little bit more about this, and I went into the library, and in my halting Italian, translated a little bit about this man, and began to think about the compass, and how it works. Now, the compass is an amazing, is an amazing piece of work, because when you look at the needle, while it'll tell you where north, south, east, and west is, the needle only points in one direction it always points to magnetic north. And it is only by pointing to magnetic north do we then are able to establish where east, south, and west are by counterpoint. But why do we need a compass? People had they used to chart their way by looking at the water and the flow of the currents, and they would watch the stars. 
The difference was, and they had maps, the difference was that on a journey, things change. And where you are at one point in your life is not where you're going to be at another point in your life. People talk about the terrible twos or the awful fours. Trust me, they're the terrible twos, the awful fours, the terrible 22s, the scary 36s, the uncertain 44s, the oh my gosh, I'm 50, the oh my gosh, I'm 60, I pray I was 50. And when my mother was in the hospital toward the end of her life, and I said to her, tomorrow you're going to be 88. And she said, I'm not going to be 88, I'm going to be 86. I, I, said, I knew she was well. And she said, I said, can you believe it? You have a son who's going to be 60. And she said, oh, if only I was 60 again. If only I was 60. On every journey, trying to find our way at every time in our life, it's important to have a way to discern where you're going against where you would like to be. Now, most of us these days, well, with myself excluded, don't get lost so easily. I've written several books about a compass, and I can get lost coming out of the parking lot. My wife once said, oh, the compass strikes again. So on metaphysical issues or psychological issues or philosophic issues, maybe I can be helpful. But the problem is that most of us don't get lost on where is north, south, east, and west. We do get lost on other things in life. We do get lost on finding, is this the direction I should be going at this point in my life? Is this the person I should be going with at this point in my life? Is this the work I should be heading toward in my life? Is this the area where I should be sad because I have not achieved that distance in my life? And so on philosophical and psychological and on emotional grounds, a lot of us feel lost. Some of us have lost our way completely in the world of addiction and have lost our way with alcohol and drugs and sex and power and money. So a compass would be helpful. But a compass that tells you where north, south, east, and west is, it's not really my problem these days. So as I thought about this, and I thought about magnetic north, I thought I would put together, not singularly a collection of ideas, but a unifying idea. A unifying idea that draws ideas together. And my intention today is to talk to you a little bit about this, and then to open it up to questions. Now, if you ask a question, I will try to respond. I will probably wander astray. And I will keep looking at you as if this was the question you asked when I have long ceased answering that question. So I ask your forgiveness and remember the introduction. I'm a very important person. <laughs> so let me tell you about how this works. But back up for a second. When my daughter was young and we would give her a gift, she would rip into it. And we said, whoa, 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 whoa there, there's instructions. And she would say, I don't do instructions. I don't do instructions. She just wanted to be part. So I'm going to try and suggest, just stay with me a moment. I've been raised around wonderful, wise people who don't do instructions. So I'm going to try and keep my instructions to a minimum. On this compass that I'm suggesting can be a compass for leaders, a compass for healing, a compass for teachers, a compass for learning, the north, east, south, and west are replaced as directional coordinates by character issues. North is replaced with humility. East is replaced with honesty. Self is replaced with love, slash passion, slash compassion. Compassion from the Latin with passion. Caring with passion is compassion. West 
is replaced with faith. I am a man of religious conviction, but it is not singularly in a religious or spiritual direction that I reference faith. But let's go back and think of these four points. What I want you to think about is that these four coordinates are lenses. Now imagine if you had a camera. Remember when we used to have cameras that had film and stuff? <laughs> when you had a camera, you would change the lens if you wanted to do a close-up, or if you wanted it to be a filter so you could do a broad shot, or to rule out some of the sun, or to have a blue filter, or to make people look younger or older. One of my lines is, sometimes the only thing worse than a, ba than a bad mirror is a good one. They're all the lenses that we can have in our life. So I want you to think about what I'm going to say about humility, honesty, love, and faith as a series of interlocking lenses. Now the reason it begins with humility <laughs> is because, a word of caution, you were introduced to a philosopher today. Aristotle said that honesty is the portal to all wisdom. And by all regards, Aristotle was a pretty smart guy. But if honesty is the portal to all wisdom, humility is the portal to all honesty. People who always need to be right can't be honest. People who want to, you to know that before anything else they are important, it is not by coincidence that pride is considered one of the major, major seven deadly sins. It isn't by coincidence that pride cometh before a fall. Or Shakespeare reminds us the man or leap himself. If you are caught in a state of pride, and we will talk about this, if you are suffering from hubris, then your ability to get to honesty will be delayed. From honesty, among honesty, why is honesty east? Well, the sun rises. The sun rises in the east for us. That's, just, that's, that's the truth. It's going to rise. This east, is, east is honesty. South is passion, love. Trust me, you cannot get to love in your life if you are filled with your own self-importance, subject to pride. You cannot be honest in a relationship. And if you cannot be honest in a relationship, you cannot be in a love relationship. If you are filled with your own self-importance, you can't get to honesty with someone else. If you can't be honest with someone else, then you can't get to love with someone else. Also, love and passion is south because we tend to think of sometimes in passion it gets a little hot. <laughs> Things heat up. You will hear me say later, what we want to be cautious of is confusing love with lust. West on the new compass is faith. Why faith? Why west? Well, I'll ask you this. The sun goes down every day. Do you go out in the streets and start proclaiming it's the end of the world? No, you say tomorrow morning the sun's going to rise again. That's the truth. I have faith that when the sun goes down, the world is an ending. You cannot get to faith. You cannot be in a faith relationship with the divine. You cannot be in a faith relationship with your wife or your kids or the people you work with or yourself if you're subject to hubris, closed off from honesty, and can't be passionate. All of those three states are interlocking lenses that lead you to this. OK. When I start using words like uh, humility, and honesty, and love, and faith, they're very shortly become words. And I can't be sure that what I'm saying is what you're hearing. So I want, to, I want us to think about these issues, but I want to think a little bit 
for you to think about them outside the box, outside the box of how you heard things, inside the music where you can hear the silence, where you're not the husband thinking his wife is deaf when he's losing his hearing. So to help you start to move your mind that direction, here's a little test. And because you've been sitting for a few minutes ready, this was a test that they gave people who came in looking for a job to see if they could think outside the box. Now, if you have already heard this story, keep it to yourself. Two, if you've already heard the story, trust me, I have heard it one more time than you, <laughs> and I still think it's worth telling. It's a rainy night. A guy is driving down the street in a car that only has one seat before the Fiat, the smart car, go with it, OK? Driving down the street on a rainy night with a car that only has one seat, on a bus bench, he sees an old friend that really did him a favor. He sees an old woman that really needs to go to the hospital, and he sees the woman of his dreams. Now, he's only got room for one in the car. Who does he put in the car? What does he do? The guy who got the job out of 200 people said, I gave the keys to my friend and let him take the old woman to the hospital, and I sat on the bus bench with the woman of my dreams. <laughs> I want to take it out of the box for a minute. I want to talk about the notion of humility, honesty, love, and faith, but I want to put it in terms that apply to your life in ways you might not think about it. And then, remember the promise? Mark Twain, the good thing about kids, they tell you what they know and then they stop, and then I'm going to stop. I'll probably tell you another story, and then I'm going to get your questions. All right, so we all know. Under humility, here are some things I want you to think about. Admit when you are wrong and ask yourself why you can't admit it. Don't insist about needing to be right. Ask yourself why you need to be right. Don't spend one more minute in your life needing to be right. Don't think because you need to be right that making others wrong makes you right. Don't exercise power just because you can. Laugh when you trip over your own pride. Learn to laugh at yourself, and your life will never be without amusement. Be a prospector. Mine your mistakes. What grows never grows old. Stop confusing what you think with who you are. Ooh, let's think about that one again. Stop confusing what you think with who you are. Don't put off accepting yourself until you're perfect. People don't do things to you. They do things for them. How often have you been caught in a prideful situation wanting to know, why are they doing that to me? You're incidental. You're from central casting. They're doing that for them. When you stop personalizing it, you start witnessing it. You start witnessing the moment instead of being caught in the moment. This is what I call popcorn time. And here how it works. Particularly around your age, you are right center stage on the things that are happening in your life. And when things are happening, you're reacting. You're in that, you're in that buzz. Popcorn time is when some aspect of yourself says to yourself, I'll be right back, and walks off stage, sits in the audience, gets a big box of popcorn, and watches yourself getting caught in circumstance after circumstance after circumstance. 
All self-transformation requires self-witnessing. When, when, when you go before a judge, they ask you, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? To be an honest witness to yourself, you have to promise to tell yourself the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There's nobody else in the courtroom. It's you. It's you being an honest witness to yourself. Perfection is a misnomer. Over every finish line in life are the words, begin here. Over every finish line in life are the words, begin here. Just when you thought you found the person of your dreams, now you get to see what it's like to be in a relationship. Begin here. Just when you thought you got the job you always wanted, now you get to find out what it's like to do that with your life. Just when you thought you couldn't wait to get to be this age so you could do that, now you're saying, oh, I didn't realize it came with this and this and this and this and him and her and me. and Humility. Let's talk about honesty. Don't lie to make people like you. Don't trade self for company. It's a bad trade. Too often when we want to be honest with other people, we're afraid of what they're going to say, what they're going to, how they're going to react. And so we wait until we really get angry. And then we tell them what we're thinking. The problem is, they then have to find their way through our entire haze of anger to hear what is the honesty that we're trying to say. Don't get angry in order to be honest. You know it in your own life. By the time somebody is screaming at you, what you're listening to is them screaming, not what they're saying. Don't think you can lie to yourself and be honest with others. All personal deceit will eventually become social deceit. All personal deceit will eventually become social deceit. All self-deceit will become other deceit. Admit what is not flattering about you and flatter yourself by admitting it. Don't think that correcting others necessarily makes you correct. Find a mistake you can learn from in yourself and reward yourself by finding another. If you're looking for wisdom, all you have to do is go in search of your ignorance. If you want to find where you are, want to have a vision, you only have to go in search of your blindness. If you want to hear the truth in life, you only have to listen for your deafness. Years ago, when I first started speaking, I would, people would say these nice things. I was a precocious young man, and I would bring this big bag on stage of all the smart things I could think of. Well, then I realized that if I just stopped to think about what I wasn't listening to and what I wasn't looking at and what I was afraid to hear, that I would never run out of material. And I'd also find out that I could connect with everybody else who was out there because everybody else was in the same experience. Here's the story, folks. We're all alone in life. Right? Every man, every woman dies in their own arms. But we are all alone together. And when you touch your own isolation, your own profound oneness in this life, then you can be empathetic to what the person next to you is going through. Now I know that people think that I will, that I will have God and spirituality with me when I'm close to the end of my life, and maybe I, I know that I'll have people who love me and will be there, but trust me. If you're not the person lying in that bed struggling with this or this and that, everybody else is on the other side of the wall, no matter how much caring they may exercise. 
Nobody else is in your shoes. And that which reminds, that allows you to exercise a capacity to connect empathetically with what everybody else is going through. So when you have the courage to be honest with your own isolation, curiously, you are no longer isolated. Do not confuse being honest with not lying about money or sex. A lot of us think that if I'm not lying about money or sex, does this ring any bells, folks? A lot of us think if we don't, we're not lying about money or sex that we're honest people. Honesty is a great deal more profound than that. It has more breadth and it has more depth. Love. Passion has built cathedrals, and passion has burned them to the ground. Be passionate about caring for others as you are passionate about your passions. You, what you love in your life allows you to express love with others. You will have to work hard in your life. Now, I know this comes as, as news to all of you. No one's ever mentioned this to you before. I'm sure your parents never said anything to you about this, and the people around you never, never told you that life was going to be hard work. So I wanted to be the first to break the news to you because I know you hold me in that regard that I have a contribution to make here today. You will have to work hard. Here's how to work smart. Be passionate about working smart. Don't row when you can steer. If you like that, thank Einstein. Bring passion to your work, and your work will be a labor of love. Bring passion to your work, and your work will be a labor of love. Give more than you get. Let go of more than you take. Release your hold on what is holding you back. Give more than you get. Let go of more than you take. Release your hold. Release your hold on what is holding you back. We are the burden in most of our lives. Now I know it's, this is not to say that life doesn't have its burdens. Uh, oftentimes when I've spoken someplace, and, uh, uh, and particular to women's groups, because women are very sensitive to this issue, I've heard people say to me, oh Noah, I know what you're saying, because I know the Lord never gives us more than we can bear. And I said, whoa. Whoa. Sometimes people are burdened with more than they can bear in this lifetime. And I don't want them to have my expectation of what they can bear added to what they have to bear. Sometimes in our life there is more than we can bear and we will collapse on the trail. It happens. Be loving to people who are dealing with more than they can bear. And please do not remind them that, if they, that this is not something that they can't deal with. Because sometimes there are things you cannot deal with. I'll tell you what you can remind them. It's a very interesting story in the book of Genesis. When God says to Noah there's going to be a flood and he tells him to build this ark and he builds the ark and then he puts a window. He tells him to put a window on the top of the ark. And for years when I would look at this and I try to understand it, I thought to myself, what is this? Is this is God being, you know, Noah looks up and sees it's raining on him? Are any of us, when life really starts raining hard on us, are we in doubt that it's raining on us? When terrible things happen to you, do you have anybody have to go... Uh, I think terrible things are happening. You say, thank you very much. I know terrible things are happening to me. Thank you very much. So why is there the window in the ark? The window is in the ark, not so Noah can tell when, the, when it is raining on him, but he can tell when the rain stops. 
In all of our life, there will be terrible floods. And th when those events happen, all of us need a place to go to support ourselves, to sustain ourselves, to somehow live through the tough times that happen. And trust me, in everybody's life, some rain will fall. As a friend, what we can remind them is, hey, it stopped raining. You can come out of there now. That whatever pattern you needed to do in order to survive that circumstance, now you can come out. Yes, you had an abusive father. You had an alcoholic mother. You had, you had all the intergenerational stuff that weighs on people that causes dysfunctional families. And I was doing an interview recently with Daryl Hammond from Saturday Night Live who said, mental illness is not an airborne disease. We all have stuff that we inherited. If we want to be a friend to someone, we say, hey, it stopped raining. It's time to come out. You don't have to be locked into this neurotic response to this painful experience for the rest of your life. The best definition of neurosis is when we choose to do something which is negative but familiar over something which is healthy but new. When we choose to do something which is negative but familiar over something which is healthy but new. The reason we do that is because our mind, our brain, little neurophysiologists will tell you that our brain is literally, literally like a bowl of jello. And it starts sending information down certain canals in your mind, and then it wants to send all future information down the same canals. So once you start to see things a certain way, you want to see them that way again and again. It's the reason when you were a kid and you went to camp or something like that, and you got homesick. Your mind was literally sick that it couldn't get back to seeing things the way it saw them always. I wish I could tell you that um, there wouldn't be tough stuff. And I wish I could have an answer that said, um, you'll be able to solve this without, uh, without courage. But I don't. Those are the facts of life. We used to be that the facts of life were meant that somebody was giving you sexual information, telling you how babies were made. Chump change. <laughs> Chump change. That's in the totally out there in the internet world. The facts of life now are that everybody's life, some rain will, will fall. The facts of life now is that sometimes Noah had to come out of the ark, and sometimes you will too. Remind yourself to do it. If you want to work in life, if you want to get things done in life, and if that is a, in your work life or your love life, to, to fuel passion, you have to be prepared to chop wood. One of the, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, there was a very important psychoanalyst named Rollo May, who said there are only two issues in life, work and love. And what he meant by that is how we relate to work and love allows us to know who we are. How we resonate against those two issues. If you have work and love in your life, you're pretty good because you can find out who you are. If you don't have one of those things in your life, well, you can still be, I was telling you, this guy, you can be peg leg Pete. You can still stand on one leg and do okay. If you don't have work or love in your life, it can be scary. Now, my character, Jacob, in one of the books I wrote, said, doesn't he say there's only love and work in life? And Jacob says, yes, there is. If you're fortunate, you will love your work. If you are wise, you will work at love. Uh, you're not expected to finish the work, but neither are you excused from it. Ethics of the Fathers, Scripture. I wrote something here and said, uh, call somebody under the idea of being loving, uh, call someone you don't know your friend. But now it's so bandied, but so, but my friends. The number one illness in the world, the number one illness in the world is depression. 
The number one reason for depression is stress. The number one stress is people trying to be, are people, is people, I'm sure my son will correct me on this one, are people trying to be in control of what is out of their control. You are not in charge of what the world delivers to your doorstep. When you have things coming your way, respond, don't react. Respond, don't react. Care when no one will reward you for it. Don't see others as others. See your vulnerability as a strength. Be cautious of those who confuse kindness with weakness. If you're in the company of someone who confuses kindness with weakness, this is not the company you want to have in life. And this is not the kind of person that you want to be in life. It is a mistake for people to confuse kindness as weakness. You will pay and pay again and pay again. <laughs> More than being giving, give a damn. Give someone else back their anger without being angry. The best measure of a civilized society, now there's a lot of thoughts about what constitutes a loving, civilized society. Remember, we're trying to understand how these concepts play in daily life and different attitudes. Now, there's some people who thought that civilized society might be classical music. But we know that's not the case because the Nazis were marching people into a death camp while they were playing classical music. There are some people who think the mark of a civilization are porcelain teacups. We know that's not the case because Japanese generals in the rape of Manchuria were drinking tea from old Chinese teacups. The mark of a civilized society is how people with power treat people without power. How you treat the widow and orphan. Love yourself when you fail and you will succeed. Faith. Now, faith is a very difficult notion for the Occidental mind to understand because to the Western personality, if you're not doing something, you think you're not doing something. But a lot of times in life, uh, there's um, you don't achieve that, this, that the, the best path toward success is taking your foot off the accelerator and putting it on the brake. In life, if you want to be a good fisherman, sometimes the best thing you can do is catching yourself just in time. There are a lot of things you might be sorry to be, take pride in what you've achieved. There would be a lot of things in your life that you'll be proud of that you didn't do, that you stopped yourself just in time from doing. There's a world of difference between giving up and letting go. <clears throat> when it's your turn in the supermarket line, in the parking lot, or waiting for others, wait your turn. Now, I want to be really clear about this. You can introduce me and say all these things about things I've achieved, and I can write a thousand words on patience and take five hours to do it, and I can lose my patience in three seconds. I've seen myself do it. I don't think that, it's, that I'm above any of these things I'm telling you. I'm telling you because this is not intellectualiz an intellectualization for me. It is experiential. Learning that people don't do things to you but for them is something that I paid to learn. Learning to be cautious of people who confuse kindness with weakness is something that I paid my dues to be able to say with you today. If I knew a better way to say it, if I could say it more succinctly or with more insight, I'd tell you. I'm not a therapist. I'm not looking to have any of you in weekly therapy sessions where you pay me X amount of dollars. My job is to brain dump as much as I can in a way that you can access it so you're not the husband saying she's not listening.
The best way to make it through the day is to remember you only have to make it through one day at a time every day. Every day. Faith sees around corners. Imagine your life was a wagon filled with everything that you are. Everything you your story, your favorites, your background, your color choices, your parent, everything that represents you is in this wagon. Now to pull this wagon in life, you've got 12 horses. But since all of us have many more horses of fear than faith, let's say you have 11 horses of fear and only one horse of faith. If you put any of the horses of fear at the front of that wagon, they'll be saying, uh, I couldn't do it last time. Your mother told me I couldn't do it. Your first wife told you couldn't do it. Your second didn't do this. I told you couldn't do it. You're a failure. You always knew you were a failure. The wagon's going nowhere. If you put the single horse of faith at the front of the wagon, the horses of fear will follow. Your fears will be fuel for your faith if you put your faith and not your fears in charge. Ladies and gentlemen, your questions, please. Yes, ma'am. In which kind of situation it will be good to lie? I'm sorry? In which kind of situation it will be good to lie? Good to? Lie. Lie. Oh, in what kind of situation would it be good to lie? I'm repeating the question because for two reasons. They, one, the video guy asked me if I would repeat the question. And two, it's always a good idea to repeat the question because then you have time to think about the question. <laughs> uh, this is the situation where it's good to lie. When your grandmother asks you, do you like my hat? <laughs> there are some circumstances in life when you want to choose kindness over honesty. That's my answer. Yes. Please. I was confused about the quote um, that, that people confuse kindness for their weakness. Or, or people are kind to you because they're weak. Like, what situation is that? What, let me ask, the ladies asked me if I would explicate a bit about choosing, be cautious of people who confuse kindness with weakness. That, where I was going with that is there are some people that if you, if you give them kindness, they'll think this is an opportunity for them to take advantage of you. Years ago, I remember talking to a young woman and saying to her, you don't have to worry about going out with strong men. Avoid going out with weak men. Weak men are going to need to dominate you in order to convince themselves that they're strong. Strong men have no need to do that to you. Right. And I'm certainly not talking about Charles Atlas, if that's an even image that relates anymore. I'm not talking about guys that pump iron, okay? I'm sure that's even dated, but you get the... the, the uh, I, for years ago, I used to say to people that uh, when I'm up here doing this, this is like me sending telegrams to myself. And then I looked around the audience, they said, uh, uh, nobody sends telegrams anymore. So I, now I'm saying, that, you know, this is not my way of, I, oftentimes I'm doing this, I'm tweeting to myself, you know? <laughs> I'm sending, you know, uh, LOL Noah to Noah. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. How do you recommend that we deal with How do you deal with people who do confuse kindness with weakness and your school or your work and you can't get rid of them? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm not suggesting the Jody Arias route about how you deal with it. Uh, uh, I, I think that you're not going to be in charge of the people around you and you're not going to be able to necessarily change them. 
What you have to be able to do is be okay with who you are. Just that, the, the line that people don't do things to you, they do things for them. That's what they need to do. When they send you, when people send you the anger, just refuse the information. That's your stuff, not mine. I've had times when people treated me and I thought it was inappropriate, and I decided I wasn't going to be angry with them because I thought somewhere down the road they would see the light and that I didn't want them to think that my anger was what they had to get through in order to come again to another place. So it's really about, it's try to straighten out what's about them and what's about you. Right? Make sure you're okay with you. If you're okay with you, anything's possible. If it's not, all personal deceit becomes social deceit. And if you're, you know, there's a great, one of the great um, uh, Christian theologians, Paul Tillich, said, forgiving is higher than forgetting because it is forgiving in spite of remembering. Yes? Uh, you, you said something about not confusing what you think with uh, what you are. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Uh, don't confuse what... <laughs> it's, uh, the question is, uh, I said don't confuse uh, thinking what you think with what you are. Let me put it another way. It's the classic... Um, don't confuse how you feel with who you are. You wake up one day and you're feeling rotten. Doesn't make you a rotten person. Right? Don't confuse what you're feeling with who you are. A lot of people are trying to get on the other side of things. You wake up and said, oh man, I really messed up last night. I just, I was just, uh, I was, you were a jerk in that moment. You are not forever a jerk. Now, I'm, and I made this reference to, you know, uh, this uh, alleged, I guess she's no longer alleged, and now she's not convicted, uh, but guilty. Uh, but uh, I, I, there is a world of difference between when we do things that are wrong and when we do things that are, that are wrong. But um, uh, mind your mistakes, and you will be a rich man. Right? Be a prospector in your own life. Take a pick to yourself. But you have to be prepared to realize that you're going to do that. If you don't do it, you're, you're, you're embracing fool's gold and thinking you're finding what's of value in your life. Yes? Uh, it's not particularly a question, but I'm just curious about how you feel about this idea. Were you just going to give me some praise? Because I'm a gold star kid, you know, early on. I, I do well. My wife laughs. She says, he's the gold star kid. He wants the gold star. <laughs> okay, please. Um, going back to the idea that, that people do things for themselves, they're not doing them to you. How do you feel about the statement of, like, no one can ever make you feel a certain way? Uh, well, the question was, if uh, people don't do things to you, they do things for them, how do I feel about people making you feel a certain way? Or people can't make you feel a certain way. I know it's an often traded remark. It's oftentimes attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt that no one can make you feel like a lesser person except you allow yourself to be perceived as a lesser person. And I, and I think there is a, a, a truth to it. But I think what happens is if you witness that about yourself, if you're an honest witness to yourself when, you've, when somebody says something that made you feel rotten, then you can ask yourself, why did that make me feel rotten? Why did I, how did I allow this person to influence my state? What is there about my own life that allows me to be vulnerable to this? And suddenly you're on your own professor. You're on, look, um, getting old doesn't make you wise. Getting sick doesn't make you a saint. Across time, you're going to have to move from being a student to being a teacher and a student to yourself and a teacher and a student to yourself and a teacher and a student to yourself. And that is sacred work. So when people do things to you and you find yourself upset, say, kind of, I'm less interested in what they say and more interested in why it made me crazy. Right now, if you're in a, pers if you're in a repetitive uh, relationship with that person uh, and, it, and it happens where people get into relationships that here's the dance, right? Um, I'll give you an example of it, about where, how this works classically. Men and women. <clears throat> Men and women. Classically what happens is the most common complaint, now this is common, not the only com <laughs> common complaint, about 
from men is that she's always telling me what to do. She's always telling me what to do. The answer, of course, is who cares? She's telling you what to do. That's her opinion. You can decide to do it or not do it. If you do it, don't complain. She tells you what to do and you did it. This is your life. She's entitled to her opinion. Decide who you are. Women, most common complaint, he doesn't love me the way I need to be loved. He doesn't love me the way I need to be loved. As I mentioned to you before, forget about it. He's from Central Casting. He can only love you the way he can love you. The question is whether he loves you. The question is whether you love you. And as soon as one of you takes that change, when as soon as you start saying, well, I appreciate your opinion, dear. Thank you very much. Uh, or, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the flowers, but I've just decided that uh, I want to make sure that I'm self-loving. As soon as that changes, the whole dance changes. As soon as one person doesn't play the same role they've always played in a relationship, the dance changes. Just change one. I'll lead this time, if you don't mind. Right? Or would you like me to follow? I'd be glad to follow. Yes, sir. So if you say that everyone does something for themselves and you know, you're alone and stuff, how would you say that you can love if you're doing everything for yourself? <laughs> Well, uh, two lonely people don't necessarily make one happy couple. The question is, if everyone is alone, how can you have love? The real simple is that two adults decide to be together, decide that they want to exercise concern and feeling and caring for each other, and each of them understands that they are alone. All the more reason why to be embraced and loved and cared for makes a difference. Because you know exactly how you would feel because of your own isolation in life. And you want to be appreciated. And it starts with you, appreciate it. You can go from there. And in that, you know, there is a, the notion in Gestalt is that one and one is three. But it's not necessarily always to the plus. There are situations where one and one can be one eighth. Where people who, when they come together, become less because they're together rather than more. Is there anybody here who hasn't seen one of those relationships? Right. Does that help? Yes, sir. Uh, so you said more than being given, give a damn. Uh, I kind of want you to elaborate on that because I didn't quite understand what you meant. Did you just want me to say that, that word again because to see if I can get away with it and they're going to be in the video library this talk? No, I, I normally. Um, I was playing on the language, obviously. That uh, we all have been in experiences where somebody acts like they're being charitable, but we know they're not really being giving. And it re what I was trying to suggest is that there was. A, a valid sincerity behind the caring. Not just doing something which is just uh, just a matter of habit. It's not ritualized uh, manners. It's something more than that. And sometimes when people are caring, they can't even find a voice for it. There's no expression for it. But every one of you in here has a friend that you know is like so loving and so caring and they may not be articulate and they may not have people who can take their love but you know that about them they're just loving and caring people and you, everyone in this room also knows someone who is like it's all, I'm doing this for you I'm always thinking about you right why aren't you caring about me we all witnessed it we all can read our minds have, there's, a, there's a, something called meta-dialogue. That is, that in every conversation, there's a subcutaneous conversation, a conversation going on below the surface. While I'm talking to you today, I'm talking to you and I'm giving this out. But in my mind, I'm looking at her and looking at him and what they read there and how much time, I've gone too long, are they getting bored, is this happening? Does somebody like this? Will they like me? Will it be good? How's this? And you're going through, well, I'm listening to you, I and mean, this is good, but I got that other class. I wonder if my car is going to get a ticket. Where am I going to be? On the, yeah. Everybody's got meta-dialogue. So in the middle of every Every conversation that we're in, every socialized conversation, there's another conversation happening. Now, sometimes it's just that. Other times it's like, 
What's wrong, dear? Nothing. Oh, okay. Now I feel better. Now I know, right? What isn't said between people is also heard. So it plays at a lot of levels. Yes, ma'am. Can I elaborate on uh, the difference between love and lust? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll give you a shorthand. It's what you get when you have a poet philosopher. Lust is seasonal. Love is timeless. Is that all right for a shorthand? Yes, sir. You talked a little bit earlier about the damaging effects of hubris, but how would you recommend finding an equilibrium before, between having a positive view of yourself and belief and confidence in yourself, and at the same time not having an overly inflated view of your ability? Mm-hmm. The question is, if you talk about hubris, what's the, and, it's a great, and it's a great question, how do you find the balance between having pride, which is ostensibly self-respect, and having hubris, which is the excess of this issue? And it's just that. Everybody, everybody knows when you're being self-respectful. You, know, you don't have to beat yourself. This is not about beating yourself up. A lot of us were raised to think that beating ourselves up is an act of character. Some of us were raised in families where the idea was if you do something wrong, may a couple, may a couple, let me take myself and beat myself. And you remember them from the Middle Ages, guys walking down the street, uh, smashing himself in the back as a, as a religious expression. Now, I, I, this may be the path to the divine for some folks. But my experience is that beating yourself up is not an act of character. And here's the way it, it changes. Um, is it, you're the, were you were the gentleman just asked me? I wanted to make sure I was looking in the right direction. Excuse me. Hi, hi. That was a great question. <laughs> here's the difference. And let me tell you how this plays in a major, major part of life. I play for, for the last five or six years, I've, I've played a, um, uh, an ongoing role in the world of addiction, in recovery. And it, and it has hurt me so much when I've seen young people stand up and say, I feel so ashamed of myself because I've allowed this to happen to me because of who I am when they finally face it. And my response is, and it plays to your question, not self-abuse, self-accountability. You don't heal yourself by beating yourself up. You heal yourself by being self-accountable. If you tell a child that he's an idiot for long enough, you will be a prophet. If you help the child to learn, the child, you will also be a prophet. So whatever somebody is dealing with when you're talking about the difference between self-respect and hubris, excessive pride, it's a di and to note it, right? it's a difference. So I'm not interested in having you telling you this about, about hubris or honesty or this and go ahead and said, I heard this great speaker today. He told me I should go home and chastise myself. No. I'm interested in you going home and not being self-abusive, but being self-accountable. All self-transformation requires self-witnessing. Be an honest witness to yourself. No one else can call it out. Only the man can call it out to himself. Only a woman can call it out to herself. We all know when we're full of beans. We don't need to wait for the gas. I was going to wonder if you didn't get that. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yes. Uh, if, I, if I can draw the question down, how do you help people when they're going through a struggle uh, and uh, what's, a, what's a good way to express that concern and caring and how can you distinguish between that and when it's self-serving? Is that a fair? Yes. Sure. Perfect. I love perfect. Uh. <laughs> uh, The best thing to do when you're there with people who are going through tough times is just to be there. 
That was uh, a visiting professor of philosophy at UC San Francisco Medical School, and there was a brilliant physician of palliative medicine up there who said to me, he would tell the young doctors, these are the brightest young doctors in this country, he'd say, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> if you know somebody who's in pain, and you just come to give them company, let them know that you're there. They'll know why you're there. No one wants to go to a hospital. You're going to a hospital to be there with a friend who's going through a tough time. And if you're going there, the last thing they want to hear is everything you did at the dance, unless they ask you to tell them everything they did at, you did at the dance. Just be in the company of someone. Here's something to remember in this process, just by, because here I am with a guy with a lot of words. But I'm also a guy who said it's a silence between the notes that makes the music. The largest organ in the human body is your skin. If you take someone's hand, they will feel it. They will know it. Your caring will come through. There will be this visceral, emotional transference. Anybody who has fallen in love not fallen in lust, knows what it feels the first time that someone else who you care for, without saying a word, takes your hand. The first time somebody, without saying a word, puts their arm around your shoulder. My mother was a really wise woman. What I remember deeply and my most isolated experiences were when she would just give me a kiss on my forehead, give me a kiss on my kepala, on my head. For all the wise things she said, for all the wise things you care or want to be supportive to somebody else, take their hand, put your arm around them, sit beside them, and just be there. When you are being with someone, you are giving them yourself in that moment. I had a very interesting conversation yesterday with uh, Dr. Gail Beebe, the president of Westmont. And we were talking about, you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation about the sacrament of the moment. Every sacrament and every religion is a portal to another transforming experience. The moment, every moment we have in our life is a sacramental moment because it can be a portal. In that moment, you have to, it's a door opening if you will enter it. There's a line in one of my books that says, an eternity is any moment opened with patience. Open the moments in your life. They asked Einstein one time to explain the theory of relativity, about time. It was too complicated for people, long mathematical equation. He said it's the difference between sitting on the stove for an hour and sitting next to a beautiful woman for an hour. One seems like it's interminable, and the other was, did that happen already? Be in the sacrament of this moment. Make your moments sacramental. Allow them to be a portal in your life. In Italian they say, vite breve, life is brief. I don't know whether it necessarily makes life longer if you enter into the moments. But I certainly know that it makes it much more profound. I would like you to um, think about some of the stuff I said to you today. Um, five or six years ago, I was talking to the senior management up at uh, Old Navy and Gap in uh, San Francisco. And a woman afterwards said, I, you know what? 20 years from now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember what you said, and I'm going to tell somebody. I said, 20 years from now, 
you'll see some kid and you'll say, 20 years ago I met this guy and I can't remember whether his name was Noah or Moses or what it was, <laughs> but he said, I said, there was a woman who knew she was dying and she uh, called in her minister. Again, I caution you, if you've heard the story, trust me, I've heard it one more time and still I tell it. A good story is like a good friend, worth the revisit. There was an older woman who knew she was dying, called in her minister to give her her, fine, her last wishes. She told him what flowers she wanted, what music she wanted played, what prayers she wanted said, and then he said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. He was taking notes and then he was saying goodbye. And she said, oh, there's one more thing. And he said, what is it? She said, uh, I know you might find this a little strange, but when I'm in the coffin, I want you to put a fork in my right hand. And he looked at her, and she said, you find that a little strange, don't you? He said, well, she said, let me explain. In all my years of going to PTA meetings and church functions and socials, when they were cleaning up the dishes from dinner, if somebody came over and said, hold on to your fork, then I knew something great was coming, like strawberry cheesecake or deep dish chocolate pie. So when people see me there in that coffin and that fork in my hand, I want them to say, what's with the fork? And I want you to tell them that I said, ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your forks. The best is yet to come. Ladies and gentlemen, you have your life ahead of you. The best is yet to come. If I can be an ally, know me as that. May you go from strength to strength, and may you be a source of strength to others. Thank you.